You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. Now, so good afternoon, everybody. It's so wonderful to be back here at the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. Such a lively group. Delicious lunch from Ed. Thank you so much, Ed. And uh, we're going to continue a little bit about the topic of tzedakah. We started two weeks ago, and there's some really important stuff that we're going to get to, like the Talmud is soon going to compare tzedakah, charity, to, we'll see in a second, let's look at the Talmud first. The Gemara establishes the minimal annual charity contribution that a person should give. What is the minimum annual charity contribution? Amar Rav Asi, Rav Asi said, "Leolam al yimna adam atzmo milaseis shlishis hashekel b'shana." A person should never restrain himself from donating to charity at least one third of a shekel each year. One second, that's quantity. One second, we're going to talk about. Okay, Shneimar vehemadnu aleinu mitzvos loses aleinu shlishis hashekel b'shana laavodas beis Eloheinu. As it states, and this verse is from. Nehemiah 10, verse 33. And we took upon ourselves commandments to give ourselves one-third of a shekel each year for the work of the house of our God. Rav Asi draws an analogy between donations to charity and donations to the upkeep of the temple, which is the subject of this verse. So we see that at least a third of a shekel should be given every year to the upkeep of Torah study, to the upkeep. It's good to give charity to many good causes, and we know that we have a commandment, by the way. So I'll tell you why everyone's like, what? What are you talking about? We know we're supposed to give 10%. That's not charity. 10% is not charity. 10% is a tithe. That doesn't belong to you. 10% is not charity. Now, we give it to charity, we call it charity, but it's not really charity. That's not doesn't belong to you. It's not like you're some hero that you're giving away 10%. Hashem tells you it doesn't belong to you. I'm giving you an extra 10% so that you can distribute it for me. Beyond that 10%, that is called tzedakah. That is called charity. So Ravasi now interprets the verse homiletically. The Amr Ravasi, Ravasi says, listen to this incredible piece of Talmud where now... Uh, 9a on the bottom in tractate Baba Basra. Shkula tzedaka keneget kol hamitzos. The commandment of giving charity is equivalent to all the other commandments combined. Whoa. Okay? All of the mitzvahs in the Torah combined is equal to the mitzvah of charity. You give charity which is, again, what you give beyond the 10%. So someone earns $100,000, 10000 is charity. Not charity, it's the tithe, but we call it that charity. Beyond that 10% is what we know as tzedakah, as actual charity. Now, the 10% will obviously count for a great mitzvah because Hashem says, I am entrusting you with this with this extra 10% so that you distribute it for me. There's a lot to talk about in this in this topic. Why? Because I'll share, I'll share with you a story and then we'll be able to take it from there. Story. Story goes as follows. There was an individual who was a very, very big philanthropist. I'm talking massive. Like one of the, one of the wealthiest Jews, he lives in L.A., and he loves to talk about his philanthropy because he wants to encourage others to give like he gives. And he gives enormous sums. Okay, I'll give you an example. When Reb Nassim Tzvi Finkel, the great Rosh Hashiva, the revered Rosh Hashiva of the Mir Yeshiva, the largest Yeshiva in the world, when he passed away, he left about $15 million of debt in the Yeshiva. Now, again, you're talking about 11,000 students. Their budget is in the tens of millions annually. So fifteen million is is rough, but it's not it's not insane. I mean it's it's negligible. Okay. So this great philanthropist from LA said we cannot continue to have the largest empire of Torah suffer like this with fifteen million dollars of debt. 
especially because his young son, who at the time was, I think, 45 years old, took over the yeshiva and was now at the helm of the largest yeshiva in the world, and the first thing he steps into is $15 million of debt. So he got together a bunch of really, really wealthy Jews, and he said, guys, this is time to step it up. And each one of them kicked in $5 million, and there's like this rich boys club, you know, of the people who can give $5 million just like that, and the yeshiva was out of debt in a half hour, and everything is great. Now, he travels around wherever the yeshiva is doing their fundraiser, and he talks on behalf of the yeshiva about the importance of people to give and people to reach deep, deep into their pockets. And he said the following story at one of his presentations. He said, and he knows, it's not a secret that he's a wealthy guy. I mean, he gives everybody who asks, he gives sizable sums. You know, he's a really, really big supporter of Torah. You know, someone has to support the yeshivas. Someone has to support the Torah institutions. So um, he said the following story. He says that he, when he goes to rabbis and he speaks to all the big rabbis in Israel, wherever he travels, he asks the same question. He says, we know that the Torah guarantees that if someone gives charity, they're promised to get the return and to continue to be successful. He says, I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer to this is. And this is his question. He says, I know so many people who were incredibly wealthy, who gave charity diligently and lost their money. So where's this promise going? There's this promise that, 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 that the Talmud says and is repeated all over the place in Jewish teachings that one who gives charity diligently and is careful to give a minimum of 10% and go beyond 10%, you give 20%, you're guaranteed enormous wealth. So how, like what's going on over here? How come some people are not being successful? And he says nobody has an answer for him. But he has an answer that he shares. He says, imagine that I hire a person to distribute the money for me. I have this big foundation. I hire a director for this foundation. And I say, listen, these are my values. These are my principles. These are what I want to support. I have $100 million in my foundation. I want you to find these specific causes that are important to me. For example, you can say, look, all Torah institutions. I want you to support all Torah institutions. How much? And this, he doesn't want to get into the details. He says, you'll, you'll, you'll give, it, give it out justly and give it out right. Okay. What happens if he finds out six months later that this assistant that he hired is getting favors for it? For example, his children's school come and they say, you know, we know that you're the gabai, you're, you're the one who's giving out the funds for this wealthy man, you know, or he needs to get his child into a school, so he gives them a, a donation from the foundation, and now he's getting all of these favors. What do you think this philanthropist will feel if suddenly, you know, the people he likes, we're talking about the person writing out the checks for him, he gives money, the people he doesn't like, he doesn't give the money to. What do you think he would say? What do you think? You say, get out. You're doing personal, your own personal benefit? You're, you're, you're personally benefiting from the charity that I'm putting you in charge of? That's not the way it works. That's not the way it should be. Hashem is that wealthy donor. We are the ones distributing the funds for God. And he said, this individual said, if we start choosing that only institutions that we favor, that we benefit, oh, my synagogue, my school. What's about someone else's school? No, that's not my values. That's not my, oh, you're deciding for God who should get and who shouldn't get. You're becoming like that distributor? No. In that, that case, God says, that's not a trusted allocator. And I think that that's a very important perspective on charity is that kol haposhet yad notimlo. We said this last week. We have to repeat it all the time. Anybody who stretches out their hand for assistance, we need to give them. Yeah, 100% of the people. We don't have to give them a lot, but you have to give them. You have to give them, especially if it's 
among your people, the Jewish people. We have to protect our own family, right? That's the first rule in charity and the rules of charity is chayecha kodmin. Your life is first. You can't give your charity to other people when your family is starving. Our nation is one family. And if you have someone in your nation, you have two charities, you know, some food bank in Argentina or your Jewish community food bank, which one goes first? Your Jewish community, right? It's your family. And then we talk about the land of Israel. Giving money to the land of Israel is giving to your own family. It's considered giving to your own city because everybody has a piece in the Holy Land. So there are a lot of priorities in how we need to give, but we do see the importance of giving to everyone. It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be $1, but it's something. And it's important for us to realize the value of giving to everything. And I try to do that. I, you know, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, not, maybe I am a very wealthy person that I, I just don't know about it. But I, a lot of people solicit me uh, for you know all my friends. They run different organizations, and every day I get another campaign, another campaign, another campaign. And uh, I make sure to give. I try to give to every single one if I get around to it. I try to give it right away, right away. And I thank them for giving me the opportunity because the more I'm able to. Yeah, I'd prefer giving everything to Torch or to my synagogue or to my children's schools. But you know what? The more I'm able to give to other institutions, yeah, there's a kollel out in Atlanta. Let me give some money to Atlanta. There's a money, there's a call in Arizona and one in Manhattan. And this one is doing outreach in England. And this one is, you know, and different demographics. And and I can show Hashem, hopefully, here, look, you gave me. I didn't keep it for myself. I didn't keep it for my own institutions that I benefit from in some way. No, I'm doing it for all of your children all around the world. And that hopefully will be a good reason for Hashem to say, you know what, I'll shower more blessing on you. And it doesn't have to be a lot of money, but something. Yes. Right, so I, I, it could be. I, who are we to know what's a punishment and what's not from the Almighty? But I, I think that it, it's important to think about it. If we are the ones who are given and entrusted with Hashem's money, who, has, who owns all the money in the world? Not us. It's Hashem. All the money is his. There's no shortage of money in Hashem's world. Hashem makes miracles with money. People who are poor become rich overnight. People who are rich become poor overnight. Hashem decides who takes and who gives. And, and we can have all the financial security in the world, and it's gone in a second. Hashem is the one in, in control. And if Hashem gives us and allocates money that we should distribute for him, which is that tithe, 10% of what we earn. By the way, tithe is not a Christian thing. They got it from the Torah. It's our Torah. Right? They pass around the plate. We have a pushka. We have a tzedakah box. It doesn't have to be. You can have your foundation and you can have whatever it is, a check, a credit card, however it works for a person. It needs to be available for them to be able to contribute. And I... It's important for us to just have that frame of mind of being a constant giver. Giving is a muscle. And if you don't exercise that muscle, there's atrophy. And it gets weak. And then people don't know how to give. And then it's painful for them to give. Then you have people who practice giving all the time. And it's just, whatever I have, I'll give. No problem. Okay. Shinamar. So where do we see that giving to charity is equivalent to fulfilling all of the commandments of the Torah, shenemar ve'emadnu aleinu mitzvos. It says in the verse, and we took upon ourselves commandments. Mitzvah ein ksiv, kan ele mitzvos. It doesn't say commandment, singular, but rather it's written mitzvos, all the mitzvos, all of the commandments. And the reason it says in a plural mitzvahs because the mitzvah of tzedakah, of charity, is equivalent to all of the mitzvahs of the Torah. So now the Gemara is now going to continue to talk a little bit about this about the, this topic. So now the Gemara says, Amar Rebbe Lazar, Rebbe Lazar says, Godol ha-me'ase yoser mina ose. Okay, Godol ha-me'ase yoser min ha-ose. It the one who causes the performance of charitable deeds is greater than the one who actually performs the deed. 
Why? Since often much effort must be expended to convince others to assist in charitable work. So imagine if you go and ask someone for charity, who is greater in the eyes of Hashem? The one who gave or the one who asked? According to Rabbi Lazar, the one who asked, who caused somebody else to give. So think about it like this. The person who's giving only gets the reward for what he gave. The person who's asking is getting the reward for his ask and for what the person gave, especially if it's a difficult ask. It's difficult. The person doesn't want. They don't want. I don't know. I don't know. I've heard all the all the things. It's really it's really amazing how charitable people have been with Torch over the years. And thank you to everyone who's contributed to our campaign. Uh, Baruch Hashem, it concluded with great success. But Baruch Hashem, but it's it's. Um, Sometimes people say, you know, I don't know, this year wasn't a great year, but, you know, this, and you try to do whatever you can. And you're trying, what you're trying to do is give people an opportunity to be part of it. I know that Hashem will succeed our campaigns. I know it 100%. And I had someone once tell me, well, that's not my values right now. It's, I'm not into a Jewish outreach. And this is someone who doesn't live in our neighborhood, doesn't live in our community. Is someone who's like, you know, it's like he says, I like you. I don't like outreach. It's not my thing. All right? That's fine. That's fine. Nobody has to give. But maybe consider this. Maybe consider that. And you try and you keep on trying. Each one of those efforts, each one of those efforts, and the refusals when people say, no, I'm, that's not worth anything to me. All right? Has anyone here ever been kicked out of an office? All right? Is that fun? No, that's not fun. Right? We should never kick anybody out of our office. Again, we want to go with the attitude that Hashem always gives. We want to be like Hashem. We always give. Again, it's not the amount that matters. It's the smile. It's the love. That is more important than the quantity of what is given or not given. If someone doesn't have and they say, you know, I love what you do. I wish I can support, but I can't right now. Right? I have no, no no problem with that. I've I've had a couple of people say, you know, it's it's been a tough beginning of the year, but I'm going to make a pledge for later in the year I will do it. It's a beautiful thing because they want to. This is understand that the the idea of charity is not dollars and cents. That's the mistake people are making. Charity is not about dollars and cents. Charity is about the heart and the willingness and the wanting to exercise the art of giving. So, Godol HaMe'ase Yoser Mena Ose. Rabbi Lazar adduces support for his statement. Shenem Arvahoyo Ma'ase Hatzdoko Shalom Ve'avodas Hatzdoko Hashkeit Vovetach Ad Olam for it is stated, and it will be that the act of charity will bring peace and the work of charity will cause everlasting tranquility and security. So, the actual giving of charity brings peace. But the work of charity, the people who are asking for charity, the verse states, and this is a verse in Isaiah 58, that when the work of charity brings about everlasting tranquility and security. Rebbe Lazar adds a warning to those who do not give charity. Zacha, if a person merits good fortune, he will give money that heaven decrees he must lose to needy people, as structure as scripture states. What does scripture say? Hello, Paros Larov Lachmecha. You will break your bread for the hungry. Lo Zacha, if a person does not merit good fortune, Vaniyam Mirudin Tavi Bayas, then wailing poor will come to his house. The Roman government, which constantly cries out that it is in need of funds, will come and confiscate that money, which could have been given to charity so that its owners will derive no benefit from it. So listen to, listen to how, how powerful this is. Anybody here ever have a water leak that suddenly is an expense? You have to replace the floors, and you have to, you know, uh, you, someone banged into your car and didn't have insurance, and now it's costing you out of pocket and whatever. Oh, why? Why? Why did it need to happen to me? Why? Right? We ever ask that? Why? 
Guess what? This the Gemara is telling us. If a person is meritorious, then they're fortunate to give that money to Tzedakah. But if not, Hashem has a different way to get that money away from them. Meaning that if a person is in a dilemma, you know, I've had people say, say this to me. It's a very interesting thing. I never knew this was in the Talmud. But I've had actually people say this to me. You know what? This money is not going to be mine anyway. I'm not going to enjoy this money anyway. Might as well give it to charity. I've had people say that to me. I had someone say it to me. This is many years ago. This guy called me up and he says, um, I want you to come to my office. I have a check for you. I said, okay, thank you so much. It's really, really special. You know, it's, it's, you already gave your annual gift. You're giving more. It's like, this is really, you know, thank you. I wasn't expecting this. He says, no, no, no. He says, I'm in, in a big divorce. He says, I want you to get the money. <laughs> I prefer you get the money than anyone else. They're getting enough and they don't need this money. So I prefer you get it. Now, I didn't want to get in the middle of the whole divorce and I don't need, I don't need to get myself stuck in that. But you understand that this is the way Hashem is saying, if you merit, your money will go to good causes and it'll go to tzedakah. And if you don't merit, then that money could end up going to pay a water bill and to pay a repair bill, and to be paying a, uh, an electrician, or God forbid anything worse than that. So it's a very positive thing for a person to always be fronting the money for charity. I sp- sat with someone this week, and he said to me, my mentor in business told me something. He says, he told me this 50 years ago, he said. And I remember it every single year again and again. He says, you want to make a million dollars a year? Give $100,000 to charity and you'll make a million dollars. That's the guarantee. Give $100,000 to charity every year and you will make a million dollars every year. It's guaranteed. And here this individual turned to me and says, it, it hasn't failed. It hasn't failed. If a person commits, they say, Hashem, I don't know where the money is going to come from, but I know that you're going to take care of me. I'm fronting my charity. Even though I don't have it, I'm committing it already. Now, a person can ask, is it irresponsible to commit money that you can't cover? That's a different thing. Okay, we can talk about that another time. But the idea here is that a person can decide, where is that 10% going to? That 10%, am I going to give it to charity or am I going to try to hold on to it? Well, if you hold on to it, you're not going to get rid of it in a good way. If you give it away, Hashem says, oh, you also get the mitzvah for it. I'd imagine if you had $2,000 right now, $2,000, it can either go to pay the plumber or it can go to charity. Which should it go to? Well, if it goes to charity, it also helps the charity and you get a mitzvah. If it goes to the plumber, what? You see, you got now a new toilet now from it. Come on. You, You have this opportunity. That's the way money is looked at from a godly perspective. It's the money is not ours. The money is not ours. The money is gifted temporarily from Hashem where Hashem says here, it's like monopoly money. Is a monopoly, monopoly, monopoly money, is it real? It's not real. It's a game. Well, the money we have is also a game. You know why it's a game? It's a little bit of a longer game. It's a 120-year game. Because once we leave this world, it's all gone. It's not ours. We're not taking anything with us. I'll share with you something crazy. Talking about living a real life dedicated to real values. I was visiting a friend yesterday. I've never been to his house before. He invited me. He says, come to my house. Interesting house. He says, I have a lot to show you in my house. Okay. So I go into his house. I say, look around. And it's I, I feel like I walked into the early 1900s. It's like, you know, all real wood floors and the, you know, the walls have the padded walls, you know, those, those, uh, you know, it's like, it brings you right back to my, remember my grandmother's house, you know, it, it, it take, took me back a century. Okay. And then he brings me into his study. My study is a very big room with a tremendous bookshelf, Tremendous, like a whole wall, massive, all the way up floor to ceiling. You're talking about a 20-foot ceiling, and he has the ladder that slides along the, uh, the, you know, it's a really like a big, big room. And then he has couches around this table that's a low table. It's like a coffee table. 
So he, you know, he's showing me around and this, and I have these books, and he showed me. We opened up some Talmuds. I actually taught him a Mishnah from one of the Talmuds. It was it was really special from his old books that he was able to find. Some are really, really, really old, like 300, 400, 500 years old. A whole collection, really special. So he says to me, do you know what what this table is? I said, no, looks like a coffee table. And it's a completely enclosed, a really big coffee table. He said, well, this coffee table is really my coffin. He said, when we were building this room and we were, and I had the the the, the uh, the contractor who was doing all the wood and all the, uh, I asked him to make a coffin for me. And it's going to serve as a table till I die. And when I die, it's no longer going to be a table. It's going to be my coffin. I'm going to be buried in this. And he opens up the top and he shows me what's, <laughs> it, it's really spooky, <laughs> spooky, <laughs> really spooky. But you know what? That's a great place to eat lunch, right? And to drink my coffee on that table, right? It's, it's, that's really special. But, but I'll, I will tell you something that is unique about this, is that a person, the Gemara says, the, the Mishnah teaches us that a person every day should consider the day of death is today. That today is the day I'm going to die. Why? Should live with that presence of mind. Because if, if we live with that way, it's not going to be a morbid sad. It's going to be a happy, exceptional day. Because... Today might be my last day. Might as well make the best of it. Every day is my last day. Every day is going to be an awesome day. And if someone has his coffee table, as his coffin, it sort of brings you into the reality of, wow, this is a serious serious focus in my day. I think it's very... I don't think so. I don't think he's crazy. I, I think it's... Well, again, it, it it's definitely not... Your typical coffee table, definitely. Again, it's it's perfect for him, and that's what we need to appreciate. That every person is different, every person is special. Everyone has their own unique, unique uh, way of expression. He says nobody knows this, by the way. Nobody knows the secret. He doesn't tell anybody. He says you're my rabbi, so I'm telling you. Okay, so it's. I think it's a very it's. It's a good thing to have this reminder every day you walk in, you see your coffee table, and you remember, you know, I'm not here forever. And you know what? Also, our money is not here forever. It's our opportunity and privilege to be able to distribute it while we're alive and to give it so that people can enjoy it, so that charities can benefit, and we can help other people. That's the ultimate goal. All right. Now the Talmud continues. The Talmud says, Rava who was the rabbi in Mechuzah, urged his community to be mindful of this warning. Amar Luhu Rav Lebnei Mechuzah. Rav said to the inhabitants of Mechuzah, Bimatusa minaychu, I beg of you, Usu bihade adodi, do charitable acts among yourselves. Ki hechid lehavi luchu shlama b'malchuzah. So that you will have peaceful relations with the Gentile governments so that the authorities will not confiscate your money. Meaning, you have two options. Either the government is going to come after your money, or you do good things with your money. That's it. Those are your two options. You ever wonder, you have this massive tax bill, like, oh my goodness, why do I have to pay the government so much? Hashem says, guess what? You could have given that money to charity, and then you wouldn't have had to pay this tax bill. It's your choice. And that's the perspective. It's a very powerful thought. That does not mean that a person should spend every penny they own. We already learned this. The Talmud says that you should not give more than a third of your income to charity. So at most, you give 30%. So if you make $100,000, at most, 30000 is going to charity. You're not allowed to give more. More is considered reckless. Right? More is considered reckless. reckless. Now, again, if someone has you know, $20 billion dollars, and they sign that pledge, you know that pledge the, uh, that they give half their money to, to charity? That's a very nice thing because, again, you don't need $10 billion to live. You need a lot, lot, significantly less. So the fact that they can give away that charity while they're alive is a very special thing. Okay. The Gemara presents Rebbe Lazar's second statement regarding charity. V'amar Rebbe Lazar, Rebbe Lazar also said, Bizman Shabbes Hamikdash Kayam, when the 
holy temple was around and it stood beautifully in Jerusalem. Adam shokel shiklo umiskapelo. A person will donate his shekel for the daily sacrifices, which were offered on behalf of the entire Jewish nation, and he would gain atonement. He would give charity and gain atonement for free. But what do we do today in our generation where we do not have a temple standing in Jerusalem? We're not bringing offerings. If people perform acts of charity, all will be well. For these selfless deeds will atone for their sin. But if they do not perform charitable deeds, then the idolaters will come and take by force funds that should have been donated to charity. And even so, these confiscated assets will be regarded for their sakes as contributions to charity. As the verse states, and I shall make your taskmasters charity. God promises that after the final redemption, he will regard all Jewish property confiscated by the Gentile taskmasters as donations to charity. You know, I mentioned this recently that my grandparents, all my grandparents, two came from Hungary, Czechoslovakia on the border over there, and two grandparents, those are my maternal grandparents, and then I had two grandparents, uh, my paternal grandparents, one was from Lithuania and one was from Berlin, Germany. And they all owned homes. And they were all evicted from their homes by the governments, either during the war, taken to the concentration camps. And they took everything. You know, everyone has these beautiful silver candelabras for Shabbos, it's the the core of every Jewish home. It doesn't have to be silver. It could be glass. It could be something special. It could be something simple. But that was the cornerstone. Back in the old days, a, a bride would get from her mother-in-law, the first gift after marriage would be the silver candlesticks. Very special. Where, where did all of them go? They weren't able to take it with them. Gone. Taken. Taken. Their homes, gone. Their clothes, gone. They had a little bag they can take with them. And even that was confiscated when they got to the camps. Do you know how much gold and silver and diamonds and rings and everything that was taken away from the Jewish people? You're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars worth. That's why whenever they say they have these special funds that Germany gives for... um, Holocaust survivors, they would give, I remember my my grandparents, one time I came to their house, they had a brand new front door to their house. I'm like, what's this from? It's from the German fund. What do you think that you're doing? Cha- what, what, what's wow? It's like, that's not charity. You stole our money. You stole our houses. You stole everything. You're giving us a door. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's like, you know, you stole our lives. <laughs> Never mind the, the money. Lives is much more valuable than all of that money. But it's, you think about it. The Jewish people were in Spain. They were all expelled. The Jewish people were, you name the place, they were thrown out, they were taken, they were murdered. What happened to all of their homes? What happened to all of their riches? What happened to all of their things? Taken away. You know what the amazing thing is? It didn't break the Jew. The Jewish people still own half of New York City. The Jewish people are still you know, who said over here, the eighth largest economy in the world is what? The microscopic Israel. In the world. You think about it. It's not about the money. It's not about the riches. It's not about the possessions. It's about our joy, our connection with God. It's about the attitude we have towards life. It's unbelievable. Someone told me that they were filing taxes once. Their father was filing taxes once, and the IRS audited them. And they said, if you don't mind, I just want to ask you, why are you auditing me? They said, because you're giving too much charity. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for someone who makes so much money, so little money, to give so much charity. It doesn't make any sense. He said, but that's what we all do. That's what we do as Jews. We give a lot of charity. 
We give charity to our synagogue. We give charity to our schools. We give charity to our to our to our torches. We give charity to to all of the different institutions. That's the way we are. That's what the Torah teaches us to do. We give charity. So this is an important thing our Torah tells us, that if you don't give it, Hashem is going to take it anyway. So you might as well get the mitzvah, right? At the end of time, if it was taken away, it'll be considered as charity because other people benefited from it, which is, by the way, a very important thing. The more people can benefit from something, the better the, the charity is. The more people. So if you, if you think about it for a second, if I can give a dollar and help one person, or I can give a dollar and help a hundred people, the dollar that helps a hundred people has so much. By the way, the Rambam says, just another thing, just so we keep these things in mind. If you can give $10,000 in a check, single check, or you can give $10,000 with $100 bills, individual $100 bills, which should you do? The Rambam says the individual $100 bills or it's single dollar bills. Why? Because every act of charity, every act of giving is strengthening that muscle, strengthening that muscle, strengthening that muscle. Each time you give again and again, that's that's the the way we look at charity. It's not a dollars and cents that's transferring hands. It's about, A, the willingness to give. Number two, the practice of giving. And the way, the smile that we give with, that's not, again, it has nothing to do with the actual amount. That's between you and God. David, what's your question? Well, so legacy definitely is. Legacy that someone leaves in their in their will uh, 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 to, to the synagogue, definitely. Or or someone giving charity to the synagogue. I, I think it is, even though there's membership fees, right? I think it, it should be. I don't know what the IRS says about it, um, whether or not it's considered. Halachically, definitely you consider it as, as part of your 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 charity. And or tithes, a hundred percent, because I don't believe that anybody is benefiting from the full amount of the charity they're giving to their synagogue. So other people are benefiting from it. So there you go. In order to have a synagogue, you need to have adult adult education programs. You need to have children's programs. You need to have a rabbi. You need to have uh, maintenance and cleanup and all of that, so that the community can enjoy it. And that's all part of the expense of, of the upkeep of, of a synagogue. That's, that's, you're contributing to that. Of course, that's charity. The fact that you're a member there is a side, a side point. Now, again, I don't know from the tax for the IRS what, what they do count or don't count. If it's, if it's considered goods or services or not, I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea. You have to speak to your tax attorney. Okay. Rava relates another homily on the subject of charity. Omarova, hi Milsa Ishtoili Ula. This matter was mentioned to me at, by the child. Who's the child? Child is Ula. Which means Olail, a young one. Now we go to nine B in Tractate Baba Basra. Mishagesh Orchase de Ime Mishme Dravalazar. This matter was mentioned to me by the child that debased the ways of his mother in Revolazar's name. What is the meaning of that which is written? And he donned charity like a coat of mail. Why is charity compared to a coat of mail? It's the chains that the knights would wear. All right, so why is charity compared to a coat of mail? Lomarloch to tell you, Ma Shiryon Ze Kol Klipo Klipo Mitzdar Refes Lishiryon Godol, just as the manufacturer of this mail, each and every scale combines with all the others to form a large coat of mail, right? Because each one is its own little ring. Aft Stoko Kol Pruto Upruto Mitzdar Refes Lacheshbon Godol. So with respect to giving charity, each and every penny, each and every pruta one donates combines with all the others to comprise a large sum. You don't need to give a million dollars. Give a single dollar because every single dollar together will add up 
to a, to the great summer. Rav Hanina adduces a different source. Rav Hanina Amar Mahachar. Rav Hanina says that the, this principle can be derived from a different place. idim And all our acts of charity are like a repulsive garment. Ma beged ze bol nima v'nima kol nima v'nima mitzdarefes lebeged echad. Just as the weaving of a garment, each and every thread combines with the others to form a large garment. Af tzdaka kol pruta pruta mitzdarefes lechesh bagado. So with the respect of charity, each and every pruta one donates combines with all the others to comprise a large sum. So this is a very interesting thing. We know that every single thread, what is one single thread? Nothing, you can tear it, very easy. But when you have a thousand threads together, then it becomes a piece of a garment. It's hard to tear. But it's only one thread. No, it's a thousand one threads. And a thousand one threads you can't break apart, you can't tear apart. The thousand one threads make a garment. The thousand little pennies that are given to charity make a sizable amount. And therefore, a person should never feel bad, which is why probably the Talmud is bringing in this idea here to begin with. Because someone might say, oh, well, what am I supposed to do? I am no Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. I can't give a sizable donation. Well, what do I have? No, the Gemara is telling you that's not what it means. Every penny adds up. Don't feel bad if all you can give is a little sum. Because every penny is part of that large sum. And it's an incredible opportunity that we have every single time we see a charity that we can contribute to, we see something that is a need, it's important to find ways to be able to be on the giving end of things so that Hashem should hopefully never make us on the receiving end of charity. So Hashem should bless us all that the partnership that we have, by the way, I, can, I don't consider myself as being a, an executive director who runs a charity. I don't consider that. I consider that a partnership that every single person who comes and learns with us and every single person who contributes is a partner, an equal partner in what we do. That's, what, that's the way it is. We're a team here. And if we're a team, we work for one another. If someone gave charity to Torch and Torch didn't produce what they wanted, that would be, that would be a, 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 uh, a breach of the partnership. So our responsibility is to produce what our investors and partners are investing in us. And that's our goal. That's our mission every single day to connect as many Jews to Judaism. My dear friends, have a magnificent Shabbos. And thank you for joining us on this Thinking Talmudist episode.